Come on. DEF CON, welcome. Louder. Okay, I'm James Kirk. No, I'm not, but he is. This is James Kirk, so let's see who he's got. All right, uh, so I, I am James Kirk. I am the captain. Uh, so I'll be giving a talk today on uh, uh, defense industrial base controls. Uh, it's uh, basically how uh, secure, uh, classified systems are uh, used in uh, defense contracting companies. So uh, I have to put the disclaimer in because I've already been catching a little bit of flack. Uh, so I'm going to tell you what this presentation is and isn't. Um, there's nothing classified in the presentation. Everything that's in it is, um, has been obtained through a Freedom of Information Act request or is publicly available on the internet. Um, but the FOIA requests do take a long time, so I've done everybody the uh, ease of including everything that I have in this presentation is included in, a power, in a PDFs on the, on the uh, DVD. So you don't have to go hunting or filing your own FOIA requests. Um, I'm also not giving any, way vi any vital secrets uh, to help the evil terrorists. You know, we don't want Al Qaeda getting there. Um, and the data we're talking about is purely collateral classified information. So in the uh, classified world, there's three different types of classified information. There's collateral, which is basic confidential, uh, secret, and top secret information. There's also information called SAP, which is a special access program. And that's um, like things like the stealth fighter program, things that are like so super secret that there's only a small amount of people that know about them. And those are um, sometimes exempt from even congressional oversight. So that means that not even Congress knows, you know, what, what these uh, defense contractors are working on. And the last type is uh, SCI. It's uh, special compartmentalized information. And this is uh, mainly intelligence information. So uh, things like uh, that are under the oversight of the Department of, uh, or DNI. <clears throat> So uh, none of the security control gaps or deficiencies identified are classified. Um, and, uh, you know, I, just, just to clear the air, there's a bunch of different requirements that are out there for protecting uh, collateral information. This is specifically to contractors. In the, in the Department of Defense and the NSA and the different departments uh, throughout the government, it's completely siloed. So in the DOD world, everybody uses DIACAP. And, um, you know, and if you go to NSA, there's going to be different requirements there. So this is purely uh, information that's derived from uh, an agency called the Defense Security Service. So a little background on who I am. Um, well, my name is James Kirk. Uh, I'm currently a senior security consultant for Rapid7. Uh, but this talk is solely my own uh, opinion. And it doesn't represent the company at all. I have to put that disclaimer out there, of course. Um, I used to be a special agent for the uh, Defense Security Service. I was uh, with the agency for a year and eight months before I just couldn't take it anymore. Um, so this topic is mainly going to be about the DSS, um, how they implement controls, how they develop them, and some of the major flaws in, in, the secu in their uh, security controls. Now, unfortunately, it's going to take me a little while to get there, so I, I hope you guys hold out. Um, it's just because I want to give some background. Not a lot of people are uh, familiar with how classified controls are put in place, how they're developed, and how they're enforced. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, people should know, I, I mean, especially if you're a U.S. citizen, and I know there's a lot of people who aren't aren't in this audience, but if you are, you should really care about how our country protects what they consider, you know, the most secret information. Um, lastly, I'm going to go through, um, you know, the, the structure of the agency and um, some of the federal standards that are in use um, in the other agencies. So uh, how are these controls uh, developed or what, what, what enforces them? So there's a, a group called the NISP and it's, I won't say it's kind of incestuous, but it is. So the NISP is actually, um, it, it's run by the U.S. government. It's, that's the National Industrial Security Program. But the NISP pack are the people who have the influence in it. And so you have uh, multiple agencies. Uh, 16 representatives from um, defense contractor companies and one, one representative from the DSS. So you have these 16 guys who are, have a vested interest in what these security controls are. So if you're, you know, I'm not going to name, name names, but if you're one of the biggest defense contractors in the industry, am I going to say I want the toughest security controls in place that's going to cost me, you know, $2 billion next year to implement or am I going to have the most lax security controls and, you know, you know it's not going to cost me anything. So it's, it's very, it's a very vested interest. So, 
you know, I don't think it's really, I don't think it's uh, good to have such a, you know, dominance of uh, defense contractors in place when you only have one representative from the DSS. And lastly, uh, the NISPAC and the NISP work together and they develop a, a document called the NISPOM, which is the National Industrial Security Program Operating Manual. And this document is the Bible for how controls are put in place. And the last time this document was updated was uh, 2005, so not really keeping track of uh, changes in security controls. So um, starting with the, uh, the structure of the agency, uh, the, there's uh, three, uh, four main directorates, uh, IS, which is um, industrial security, uh, CI, which is uh, counterintelligence, uh, DISCO, and CDSE. So if you have worked in the, in the classified world before and you have a security clearance and you're not in the government, you've gotten your security clearance most likely through DISCO. That's what most people know about DSS is that, hey, they, get, they did my security clearance, they did my background check, that's who they are. Well, the funny thing is they only, it's only like a small percentage of what they do. A CI is just how it sounds. Uh, they do counterintelligence. Um, if a c defense contractor gets hacked um, or if there's a, a foreign agency that's trying to target that company, a counterintelligence group will go out there and interview them. Um, I've got some slides at the end of the presentation that go over some of the information that has been aggregated from counterintelligence. And industrial security is the primary portion of the agency and they're the ones that do the inspections of contractors. Um, and uh, so ODAA is a sub group of uh, industrial security. It's called the Office of Designated Approval Authority and those are, these are the guys that handle just the uh, computer systems uh, that process classified information. Uh, there's four regionally dispersed DA DAAs. These are designated approving authorities and these are GS-15s and uh, if you know anything about military-esque, they're the equivalent of a, of a colonel or a, um, uh, a captain in, in the Navy. And so they're pretty, I mean, they, ha they carry a lot of authority. And uh, they're the ones who derive the security controls to, uh, based upon where, you, where your company is in, in the country. So it's uh, like West Coast, uh, Southern uh, part of the United States, East Coast, and then uh, the Capital Region. Um, the agency is run by a few SESs, and these are senior executives um, that are appointed uh, by the uh, Under Secretary of Defense. And so the main thing I'm trying to get here is the DSS is ultimately responsible for enforcing everything that's in the NISPOM. And so if you're a defense contractor and you're processing classified information, the DSS is going to have oversight of your company. So how does a company process classified information? It goes through a certification and accreditation program. And so when I worked at the agency, basically what would happen is a contractor would say, okay, we want to stand up based upon our contract, you know, 50 or 100, you know, let's say they're secret systems. And so what they do is they fill out this, you know, 15 page document, they click on a couple things and they send the document to me. I have 28 days to review it, I look at it, I mean I can't tell if they're lying or not because I'm not validating anything. I'm just looking at what they put in there and make sure that there's, uh, th that they've signed it, that it's correct and then I send the document up to my boss who approves it. And he doesn't review it, he just makes sure that I have all the appropriate documentation sent to him. So after it's approved, uh, the, the contractor can then start processing secret information or whatever level they've asked for for up to six months without any oversight, no validation if they have security controls in place. It's just based upon their, their, their trustworthiness. Now, um, and then they can ask for an extension and get another 180 days. But usually we have to look at them between, between six months and, and a year. And when I'm working with a company, I'm only working with one person who's been designated as the information systems security manager. And this can be, I actually I've seen it a few times where this guy graduated uh, with a master's in business, worked at uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car for a year, and now he's been appointed to the ISSM. He has no security experience, doesn't know anything about uh, information security, and he's the person who's ultimately in charge of, in this case, uh, a Fortune 500 company running, you know, you know, thousands of computers are connected doing top secret information. I don't know why, but that's the way it is. I don't get to choose who they pick. Um, but the only thing that, that stops that is there's a uh, regulation in the NISPOM that says they have to be trained to a level commensurate with the company or with the level of the information system. And that can be, I mean, that's so ambiguous that we can never really enforce it unless they do something, you know, disastrous. Then we can say, well, you're an idiot, so find someone else. 
Um, so uh, my role was an ISSP, Information Systems Security Professional. Um, uh, during that six month period, uh, we get, oops, where am I going here? Okay. So uh, we schedule an on site visit with the company. And so, uh, you know, I email back and forth to say, hey, what's a good time? And we go out to do a visit. Now, this is for the accreditation portion. And uh, this is within a six month period. We go out and I spend maybe a couple hours with the company. And uh, we don't have any tools to do the evaluation. We're not allowed to run tools on the contractor systems. So, um, <coughs> All I can do is ask them to click through things and show me that it's configured correctly. And, um, you know, it's based on a simple checklist that says, our password's in place, our password's X characters, et cetera. Um, as for applications, we don't really care what applications are installed in the system. We don't care what patch level the applications are at. And um, it's, it's a pretty generic uh, accreditation. Um, so after I do that, and then I do some more paperwork again, and I send it to my boss, and he says, hey, they're good to operate for three years. So, uh, okay. Uh, then within the, uh, so these companies, if they're not processing uh, computer systems, they're still subject to an annual inspection. That's where we go out and check, make sure that uh, they have people who have access to class information in the safes actually have clearances. So uh, we now add them under as part of our, their annual inspection. So it might be two months from now, I'll go back out there again and do their annual inspection. And this is a lot different than the accreditation. This is when I go in and we just basically tear apart the company. We open up all the safes, all the drawers. Uh, we have basically unfettered access to anybody who might have access to that classified, classified information or, uh, you know, the systems. And that's where uh, it was a little bit more fun because then you go in and you just get to, you know, sometimes tear apart the company. <coughs> And so if we find any discrepancies there, then we fail the company or give them a lower rating. I'll go into that. So, uh, and that's uh, kind of out of place here a little bit, but um, what I'll do is they'll do the security controls first. So these are security controls that our companies um, are required to implement. And starting with Linux, um, I kid you not, this is straight, I have the, the reference here. This is the only requirements that they must implement that are specific to Linux. So, uh, if you have experience with Linux, this, uh, I hope you understand that this is not sufficient. Um, so when I first got to the agency, uh, I knew this was a contractor already. Uh, I was kind of on a mission to, when I got to the agency, I was like, well, uh, their security controls are crap, uh, for Linux at least, and so I'm going to try to work to implement some better controls. So uh, my partner and I, uh, within the agency, we spent about seven months when I got there, developing security controls for Solaris 10 and Red Hat 5. And these were supposed to cover both the Unix and Linux variations. And we put some generic, uh, generic remarks in there so that uh, if it was Solaris specific that they could implement it, but if it was just basic Unix they could implement it as well. This document ended up being about 156 pages. And it sounds like a lot, but it was mainly like, I mean, like we're talking about enterprise rent -a car people here. So it's like click on this button, type this command in. So you have to really baby step people through it because if we ask them to implement something that they can't, our agency gets blamed. So this is, um, so when I was talking about the NISP NISPOM being the uh, Bible document, that is very true. But uh, as you see the reference is, it says ISL. And so the agency at any time can issue a thing called an industrial security letter. And these clarify sections in the NISPOM. And their attempt to, the NISPOM didn't address anything in Linux at all. And so they came out with this ISL in 2007 saying, we're going to make sure that we protect Linux appropriately. And so here are the really important things you need to protect. You need to turn auditing on. So here we go. Um, and then in 2009, they decided to, to clarify more. And I'll, that'll be on the next slide. And in 2009, uh, they came out with, um, another ISL that I would thought would cover Linux, but instead it just covered Windows. Assuming that, I guess they're assuming that every defense contractor purely uses Windows, but that's actually the exact opposite. <clears throat> so I did a quick comparison here. I hope it came out okay on the screens. Um, but uh, DISA, this is another agency in the government. It's called Defense Information S uh, Systems Agency. They're the ones that actually come out with controls for like CIPRNET or uh, at the NSA net or FBI net. These are really, I, I think they're pretty secure. I mean, as you can see, they cover a lot of different things. I compared, a uh, quick comparison between what the STIGs call for 
and what uh, the NISPOM and ISLs cover. So we don't cover discretionary access controls at all. We don't care if you use privileged commands. We don't care if you print things. We don't care if you take things off the system. And uh, you know we don't care if uh, security security uh, personnel do anything either. And so you know the it, it's kind of funny to me because some of these things are the things that we should care about the most. Because you know if I'm processing classified information in a company, I'm not caring about you know some ninja trying to sneak in, break through a, a, a secure room. I mean we have we have locks on all the rooms. Uh, we have motion sensors in the rooms. These are all requirements. And you know I can't recall a time when someone actually broke into a classified room and stole stuff. What we care about is the insider threat, the disgruntled employee, or you know some foreign nation person who's been infiltrating into the company and is on a is on a mission to steal stuff inside. And the only way that's going to happen is if we're tracking and auditing people printing stuff off or exporting the media. And I mean I'm going to get into it at the end, but I mean this is a perfect example of the WikiLeaks. You know whether you're for it or against it. Um, you know, this guy was easily able to take a CD and burn stuff all day long. <coughs> With the WikiLeaks thing, uh, Bradley, uh, the the army did fix the controls and they turned off USB store and uh, they turned off all um, exporting to media and they try they audit everything now. But the DSS did not agree with that. They said it was it would cost the contractors too much money. So, um, <coughs> one second here. Sorry. So, in 2009, uh, we came, like I said, they came out with Windows baseline standards. Uh, this was um, similar size to the document I wrote, about 150 pages. It uh, it came out with uh, and also a document called the Standardization of Baseline Technical Security Configurations. Um, it's a long, stupid name, but it basically it says this is how you configure Windows. Um, here's the thing, though. <laughs> I mean, uh, a lot of companies have fought this because the NISPOM is the only document they have to follow. And the baseline standards, clearly in the front of the book, says this process manual is not directive in nature. It just says that if you want to get approved in a timely manner, you have to follow the document. But what if I'm a company and I don't want to get approved in a timely manner? What if I just don't give a shit? Well, then, you know, you don't have to really follow the document. And then, uh, lastly, in, in 2011, um, uh, they actually worked on a document uh, that modeled uh, NIST 853 standards, and it uh, it does pretty good. Um, I mean, NIST is also based on what the STIGs are based on, so I thought they did quite well with that. <coughs> However, uh, it doesn't matter when uh, these documents came out. If you are approved in 2009, uh, you don't have to update until your next accreditation date, which is three years. So you can still run unsecure for three years, in my opinion. Um, of course, Linux is still left out. Um, I guess they still think those seven different things are the, you know, end all be all of Linux controls. Um, <coughs> some of the major changes in the June 2011 one was um, uh, they've moved to 14 character passwords finally, uh, which has been a standard in place for quite a while with NIST. Um, however, uh, the NISPOM still overrides that because it says they only have to use eight character passwords. Um, so we've been, uh, when I worked at the agency, I was fought all the time. Uh, they finally addressed patching. So in the past, you never had to patch any of your applications. Uh, it wasn't required. And um, so now it just says that uh, if, you f if the ISSM, which is your enterprise rent a guy, rent a car guy, uh, thinks there might be vulnerabilities resulting from software, they have to patch it. Now it doesn't say it says expeditiously, but as a as you know as a special agent going to to do an inspection, what what does that mean? I mean, how do I co hold a company to uh, an expeditious timeline? It's not really fair to the company, and it's definitely not fair to the agency because you can't you know that's not that's not an enforceable standard. Uh, they also sort of addressed USB drives. Um, they said that they must be tracked and accounted for. Um, what that means again is uh, up to interpretation, um, and they should be disabled if possible. And that is an un unenforceable action as well because all a company has to say is we run you know, USB keyboards. Okay, well, cool. You don't have to use. You can use USB drives. But oddly enough, um, there's a there's an item called Dibnet, and this is for um, if a, if a company's been hacked 
um, they report uh, this information to through a system called DivNet. If they're if they're a big contractor, no one no one cares about the small ones. So only if you're a big five do you, are you part of DivNet. And so if you uh, do have a DivNet console, um, you are required to have USB storage disabled. Now, why that matters between a uh, system on DivNet and not? Um, does, there's no, doesn't seem to be anybody who can tell me the answer to why. Um, from a risk standpoint, uh, I'd like to know why. I, I, I do know why. It's DC3, and they do care uh, why they don't want people using USB storage devices on their system. So. <clears throat> and the last one, uh, oh, yeah, so, yeah, the things that are major changes are successful and unsuccessful logons, et cetera. Um, they kind of went into more uh, what auditing capabilities are. Uh, last one is security seals, and I kind of find this funny because the big tamper evident contest every year. Uh, they have to be they have to be approved tamper proof seals that are pre numbered. Now um, I can tell you internally uh, there is no approved list. So what an approved tamper proof seal is I don't know. Um, we just go out there and if there's a number on it, I've seen people put marker number on it. Cool, works for me. Um, and there uh, it's so when you process, you're supposed to make sure no one's put a you know keylogger in your in your keyboard. And then you just look for the tamper seal. Um, okay, so how do these controls even get developed? I mean, who says that uh, you know they have to expeditiously patch the systems? Well, uh, I can tell you, there's a GS14 who works at the uh, agency headquarters, who uh, used to work for a defense contractor, and um, he, I would say, he's he's quite intelligent, and he's a GS14, um, but he just thinks shit up. Like that sounds cool, so he puts in the document and. Sends it out for um, to 24 different federal agencies, and they either give it a yes or a no. And if they don't answer, it's approved. And then they issue this document out, and uh, here we go. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that uh, my friend and I we developed this document. We sent it to this guy, and we also sent it to uh, he's a GS15, the head of the ODA. And the answer was thanks, but no thanks. Like they just didn't they didn't want it. They didn't want to deal with it. Uh, they said that they had sent out a previous document that was, I, I kid you not, it was a copy and paste from, uh, Solar, uh, from Oracle on how to implement Solaris. And it was just a copy and paste from their implementation guide. And the uh, 24 federal agencies, this is, you now this is an honest thing. If you, if you know Linux really well and you want to work for the government, you will get hired. Because within the ent entire agency I worked there, there was only four guys who could do an, a Linux inspection at a company that has primary Linux systems. And so when we set this document out, Two of the four guys were the only ones who could review it, so um, it didn't get reviewed. They sent it to the agencies, and the agency said, "We don't understand what to do with this, and so we're not going to say yes or no." So the agency that I worked for said, "We're just we're just going to pass." So there's going to be no Linux standards yet. Okay, so um, when we were uh, when they're developing these security controls, and they're saying, "Well," How do we test these before we say a defense contractor has to use them? I mean, how do we know that we're not going to break their systems, you know, just by thinking shit up? Well, we use a lab environment, which consists of a laptop from 2006, a hub, and another laptop from 2006. And uh, well, when I first got this uh, lab environment, um, it had uh, Windows on it, and I didn't have access to the BIOS, and I couldn't in install Linux unless, well, we just pop popped in board out and reset it, but that's uh, basically all, that's what they have at headquarters as well. So honestly, the test resources are limited, and one of the biggest complaints about the agency is that the controls aren't developed. So back in 2009, when they first came out these this huge document on how to implement Windows, um, they did, and basically the people who actually followed the document line by line ended up locking their systems out because it <laughs> it makes them turn. Uh, Shut down, shut down if unable to audit, which is a good, a good setting, except that they turn an auditing feature on that logs like 10,000 audits in like two minutes. So as soon as they turn it on, it shuts down the system. <coughs> hey man, it's the federal government. What can I say? Um, I'm not sorry. I'm not trying to make this into a bash thing for the federal government. I mean, I, the whole point of this is to, I mean, I just want them to adapt. I mean, there's great security controls out there. Uh, you know, they, if they just used them, it would work fine. So, um, how does enforcement get done? Uh, it's through a credential special agent. It's uh, through a 0080, which is the guys that do with the physical security. And um, and there's also 2210s, which is what I was, IT specialist. Um, 
So when you get onboarded, they, they, uh, they do a phone interview and they say you're hired. Um, and the phone interview was uh, about 10 questions. Uh, the one question that referenced Linux was how do I show running processes? And then I was a certified Linux guy. Um, and so, I, you know, not to offend the guys that are other, you know, actual real special agents, uh, these special agents, they don't carry guns, uh, they have no law enforcement authority, they just carry a badge and the most we can do is throw it at somebody. <laughs> um, so it's kind of, the only cool thing was I got an undercover car and so I'd go speeding in it and when you get pulled over, it's registered to the Attorney General of the State of Texas, so it's kind of fun. Um, so they, for training, they onboard you and they send you to the DSS Academy. And you're like, sweet, I'm a special agent, I'm going to go to the academy, I'm going to go run around with the FBI. Because it is on Quantico. But you get there and um, it's a two week course and they teach you how to do an inspection, which is uh, basically getting on a ladder and looking around in the ceiling to make sure no one's hiding up there. And uh, I'm like, okay, so when are, we getting, when are we getting to the computer side? I mean, I'm, I'm an IT guy, I'm not here to do physical security inspections. Like, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's next week. Okay, so go through the first week, cool. I'm now certified to do physical inspections. Second week, uh, they're like, okay, so here's how to do a computer inspection. They put a Windows PC connected to a hub with another Windows PC. And they give us a checklist that checks to make sure that uh, you can log in and that there's passwords set. And now I'm certified to um, do PC inspections. They call them peer to peer LANs. Uh, and so I brought the question because I used to work for one of the one of the big defense contractors. Said, well, what about like a 5,000 node WAN? I mean, we had that at my company. Oh well, um, you know that's just the OJT. So well, well, I work in Texas in an office by myself. So uh, how am I supposed to get OJT? Now I already knew how to do the inspection. It was just more of like, you know, rhetorical questions to see what their answer was. And they don't they don't have one. And that's the, the extent of the training. And the thing is that this training is to encompass either 0080s and 2210s. So you have these guys who have never touched a computer in to do inspection, these people that are just actually physical security specialists that are now doing computer inspections. They're the experts out there certifying systems. And so this is a job posting I want to show you guys from the agency. These are the requirements you have to be to be a GS13 in the, in the agency which is actually a quite high and a high highly paid position. Um, there is no Linux requirements so you can see that. And it, like I, I'm stuck on this Linux thing because it's, it, it gets under my skin but uh, you don't have to have much experience at all. And the people that are interviewing for these positions, basically if you have a CISSP, you're hired. Because the people within the agency have such a hard time getting their CISSP that they end up getting terminated. So if you have your CISSP, you're, you're golden because it's not, it's a tw it's a 8570 uh, IA level three position. <coughs> All right, so what happens during an inspection? I kind of went over it a little bit. Um, uh, if we go in, it's uh, depending on the size of the company. Uh, there's a few different sizes. There's double A's, which would be um, like a, a company that that makes airplanes, and they have a huge. I mean, they're building you know strike fighters. Well, I'm not gonna name names, but these are big big uh, facilities. So we have like seven guys to do IT, spe IT inspections there. And it's, you know, sometimes it's complex. They put the guys with the best skill sets to do, this, do, to do the portions of the inspections that they're good at. I always get stuck doing Linux and uh, uh, network controls, like uh, firewalls. Um, so, uh, partners with industry. Um, so this is kind of a new term that uh, happened since I got there. Now, um, if you remember with, uh, the uh, oil rig out in, out in the Gulf of, Mex or Gulf of uh, Mexico. Um, the mineral management uh, agency was responsible for doing the inspections of these uh, oil derricks or these uh, oil rigs. And, but they're kind of incestuous as well with, with uh, oil companies. It was very lax oversight, uh, not very strict controls. Sometimes they didn't do the inspections. And they were partnering with them because, I mean, we want to make, make sure that they make, make money. And so that's the same thing. When I got to the agency before, it was always, they're a compliance oversight agency. We have to hold, you know, the company to a standard. Well, uh, when I got there, um, there was a lot of complaints that the defense contractors thought we were being too hard on them and we're not letting them make enough money. So we have to partner with them now. And so what does partnering with mean, with mean? It 
it has, it's another <laughs> ambiguous term. All I know is that uh, I had a GS15 accompany me on an inspection at a big organization. And before we could uh, give them the daily findings that we found, we had to review them with the GS15. And I had uh, um, two, two different findings, so just an example of um, auditing not being done. They have to do audits weekly. And uh, passwords, uh, passwords weren't com complex enough. And he's like, well, why can't we combine those findings in the same one? I said, well, they're not the same thing. But because the inspections are done by a numerical basis, and if they get 15 findings, for example, then they might fail. So if we only give them 10, then they're good. And we don't want to fail one of the big five contractors. And so if, if you're not compliant, and I've actually done a few failures, uh, then we, um, it's noted in the security log, uh, they get enough findings, then we give them a marginal or an unsat rating. A marginal just means they have to do a reinspection, and if they fail it again, then they go an uns unsat. And if they're unsat, uh, they get two inspections to fix it, and if they don't, then uh, their, I think their contracts get um, suspended for a certain amount of time. All I know is that I went to a, a location and they had a top secret, it's called SINWITI, Critical Nuclear Weapons Data. A, uh, it was a document that contained basically all of the uh, missile silos that are hidden, that are secret in the United States, and it was a filing cabinet. And so um, we're like, okay. So we take the document and move it to the Air Force Base to actually properly secure it in a skiff. And uh, the director of that company had already called the director of my agency and was pissed off about it. I guess they thought uh, the filing cabinet was appropriate uh, storage for a top secret document. And by the, by, uh, I mean, if you're not familiar with it, top secret documents have to be stored in a, uh, in a room, within a safe, and the safe has to be alarmed, so. Um, here are some common vulnerabilities that uh, are actually pulled from the DSS website um, that are found. <laughs> not auditing is, is the top one, which is kind of funny. Um, not reporting classified compromises. That's great. Um, poor safe combination security. Processing on unaccredited. And this is great. Uh, we go to a company and they have systems that are just like, you know, fuck it, let's process classified on it. And we go there and it used to be we would shut them down. We would take the hard drives and put them in the safe and make sure they didn't use them. But now we just tell them it's a good time, it's a good, good thing to submit that document. Can't tell them when they have to submit it, but they should submit a document for accreditation as soon as possible. <clears throat> okay, so uh, an overview of some of the inadequate controls that are in Windows. Um, patching, like I said, it's very ambiguous. And um, I mean, we can't, I mean, if, it's just, if the document's not patched, I can't tell them to patch it. I mean, I just have to tell them that it, you know, they should expeditiously pass, patch the system. Okay. Um, USB, uh, that's how stuff gets taken off the system. Uh, virtual environments, shit, if you're running VMware or, you know, any other virtual system, excuse me, there are no security requirements for it. Do whatever you want. Uh, UAC, um, if you, you know, with Windows 7 and Vista, not addressed at all. Um, classified data is not audited. That's another thing that bugs me. I mean, I don't care if you click on, you know, I don't know, a fucking folder on the system. I just care if you're taking classified data off the system. Uh, training is another one that bugs me, is that we're not required to have these guys, you know, sufficiently trained. I think that there should be a firm training requirement for the ISSMs, and it shouldn't be a person firm enterprise. Um, so for Linux, uh, honestly, there's just too many to list. Um, I kind of did an overview here. Uh, the problem is there's a lack of expertise within the agency. And, that, and there's a lack of expertise in the government. And if you, know, if you drive down uh, uh, I-35 in Texas, you'll see signs everywhere that says, no Linux, we'll hire you. I mean, so there's a, I mean, this is a, a good thing to learn is if you're not familiar with Unix and Linux or you don't feel comfortable with it, I mean, there's job opportunities out there all over, all over the United States. Um, this is the bottom one, it's kind of funny. Uh, so I went to a company and they didn't have any of the auditing, audit.rules set up. And so I logged as a finding. They fought me on it, and I was told that uh, nowhere in the documentation does it says, say that they have to have the audit.rules file configured. So they don't have to have any auditing flags. So they're not going to audit anything, and it's not a requirement. So uh, same issues that affect Windows as, as Linux, uh, patching, USB, virtual environments, and tamper controls. Um, like I said, there are no approved tamper controls, so uh, and that there are no approved tamper seals. So uh, they can use whatever they want. I've seen people use, like, not tape, but 
like kind of laminated stuff and then they put uh, a number on it and that works. <clears throat> okay, so kind of bust moving through these pretty quick here. Um, so the whole point I think is if you do work in this world, um, you know, I'm not trying to bash the companies, I'm not trying to bash the agencies. But the point is that I think there should be a partnership. There shouldn't be this term of partnership, partnering with industry. There should be a real partnership with if the government won't come out with controls, you need, you need to not stick your head in the sand and have an ostrich effect. You shouldn't say, well, they didn't tell us that we had to have 14 character passwords on Linux systems so we're not going to implement it. Well, that's just a crap answer. I mean, if, you're work if you really are implementing the security controls and you have the experience, I think it's your responsibility to make sure that the systems are, are, are configured appropriately in the absence of security controls. And, you know, with the, with the government, you know, help them. Sorry to say, you have to help them develop the controls. Me giving this talk is not going to make them come out with a Linux document tomorrow. It'd be nice if it did, but I don't think it's going to happen. So, um, why does this um, talk matter? So, uh, whether you believe it or not, there are real uh, agent, uh, governments out there, uh, other nation states and even people that are targeting the US technologies. And so I, I've actually taken, this is, the counterintelligence group within the agency is fantastic. And um, the only downside to the counterintelligence agency is that now um, if the NSA detects that your company's been hacked, uh, the counterintelligence agency, or counterintelligence group will go out there and talk to you about it. And so will uh, a representative that was like me. Except we can't tell you who hacked you, we can't tell you what they hacked, and we can't tell you how to fix it. You've just been hacked. Sweet. So um, here are some actual uh, real data of what, uh, this is for East Asia and Pacific. Um, if this was a classified briefing I could give you the real countries, but it's not. So um, we have to be generic here. Just, you know, put it on a map. Uh, this was for, for FY09, so from October uh, 2009 to October 2010. And uh, so you can see direct requests, these are people who are like, hey, send me some classified shit. Uh, doesn't work so well. Um, but uh, solicitation is seeking employment. Now this is only 6% and you, yeah, I think it goes up in the next slide. But um, what, they do, what they're doing is they're, they're sending these resumes out and they're like, well, um, I'd like a job and work in the classified world. And they, you know, sometimes you have the HR people who are like, well, I don't, I don't know, you know, where they're from. Excuse me. So they hire them on, they do a background check and hopefully uh, DSS uh, sees that they're from China and that they're, uh, you know, not using China as a, well, I'm using China as an example, but it could be anywhere, you know, s where they have people that work for part of the PLA or work for the Kremlin and, th you know, they're being paid to infiltrate a company and steal classified information. And so that's, that's what the seeking employment is. Suspicious internet activity, I honestly don't know what that is, but I guess it's probing the network, outside network. <clears throat> Um, so now it's great. It said suspicious network activity. I guess is going up. It's where they're actually specifically targeting the company. Uh, I guess seeking employment did go down. I think that's because a lot of the times uh, when they do get hired on, uh, Disco does a pretty good job of weeding out, uh, you know, uh, potential infiltrators, and they just deny them clearance. Uh, conference and trade shows. There's a lot of, um, it, you know, there's a lot of defense contractor trade shows where, you know, they fly to France and they they try to sell airplanes. And so uh, there's a lot of foreign nations that go out there and target these. Uh, so this is for uh, Near East, um, and this is FY09. So employment's quite large there. Direct requests, and then here um, employment's gone down. Uh, academic solicitation. This is uh, interesting. Where uh, I, we've gotten a lot of suspicious reports where a um, you know, there's a professor, like we used to do inspections at, we do inspections at big, like some of the biggest uh, universities do a lot of research for the government. And it's, it's, it's actually pretty cutting, cutting edge. And so you have guys that are like, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to um, come, come to your school or I'd like to do a research project with you. And, you know, they misspell the guy's name. It's like a, it's like a Nigerian email scam sometimes. But uh, they're trying to work with this guy who's working on a classified project. Uh, this is for Europe and Eurasia. And then this is FY10. 
And then this is uh, South and Central Asia. And then uh, FY10 as well. So South and Central Asia, they have a higher uh, percentage for solicitation and seeking employment. Now, um, when I first did this talk, I didn't think I'd be in track one, so I had actually brought the book with me to share because there's more information in it, but uh, it's actually quite a large room, so. Um, if uh, afterwards you would like to see some more information on it, I'll be in the QA room and I can actually take, let you take a look at the document where this is derived from. So uh, wrap up and I hopefully have some time for questions in here as well. Um, so why the talk, right? So um, like I said, the talk's not meant to bash the agency, it's not meant to bash the companies, but I think honestly the federal government's been kind of, not necessarily the federal government, I'll say the DSS has been remiss in developing appropriate security controls to protect classified information uh, in multiple areas. And I don't want to say uh, that it's primarily because of money, but it, it really is. And what happens is when we, solicit, when we start developing new documents, like the new NISPOM is coming out, I believe in 2013, is you have 16 representatives from different contractor companies that are, um, they're the ones who get to, you know, they're the ones who get to help draft this NISPOM. And so it's, you know, it, like I said in the beginning, is it their best interest to develop the most hardened security controls that are going to cost them the most money and hire the most, you know, technical people to implement? Or are they going to go for lax controls that allows them to just be willy nilly with, um, with implementation and hiring people from enterprise? So, you know, that's, I think that's why, I mean, this is my personal opinion too. So, you know, you, you can think of whatever you want of it. Um, I, and I also think, like I said in the beginning, that it's important uh, if you are a citizen to know how the security controls are developed and how they're implemented. And I mean, because ultimately this is your data, right? I mean, the federal government should work for us, not the, not the other way around. And um, you know, I have to put some buzzwords out there too. So Stuxnet and Flame, right? So these are uh, malware that uh, we now know that have been developed by the U.S. government with in conjunction of other countries. And how are those, how are those put in place? Well, I mean, you have to have, like these systems are not available on the internet, they're not routable. But you have to have an in insider that puts this, this malware on the systems and I mean, what's stopping that from happening here? There's nothing. There, there's absolutely nothing stopping people from coming in an insider and putting, you know, malicious uh, malware on our systems and harvesting data. Now I'm not saying that uh, security controls will stop it, but at least, at least to help audit it it'll tell us what happened or it'll slow them down. And uh, you know, by auditing removal media or stopping removal media from being used on the system, you know, we can stop, you know, another Bradley Manning or another WikiLeaks incident. You know, like I said, either, you know, either for or against it, I think that um, some of the information that's been released is good. But you know, a lot of the information is, I mean, it's, it's classified for a reason. So um, I think sometimes the government overclassifies stuff, but you know. Uh, anyways, I do have all my references in the document too. Um, this is all available on the uh, CD or the DVD. And um, you know, I guess if anybody has any questions, I, I'd definitely like to answer some. Uh oh, do we have one here? I'll give it a shot. Sweet. <laughs> so I've worked on government projects of various sorts and one of the things that's frustrated me is that between the NIST guidance and the DISA guidance and, and, and the NISPOM stuff, not only is the, uh, are the guidance for auditing kind of not great, the tools suck and there's no decent way of creating a good build, a known good build. Do you think there's a lot of room for that? Do you think that the industry would respond if you said, all right, here's a kickstart for Red Hat Linux 5 or 6 that, uh, that builds it secure and go with that? Well, I can definitely answer that. So um, back in, uh, actually about two years ago, uh, they came out with this, it's called a NISP tool. And it's, um, it's, it's supposed to work quite well. It configures your system for you and you're good to go. But it only works on, on Windows, of course, but uh, that's another uh, tangent. But anyways, uh, what happened was uh, we went to, uh, I didn't go, but it was part of another uh, inspection at a large uh, defense contractor. And the guy accidentally hit configure instead of uh, verify, like the DSS guy. This is when they let us use uh, tools on systems to automate, you know, help our inspection process. So he hit configure instead of, um, you know, inspect. And so they reconfigured their system and totally destroyed it. Um, 
And so that was the last time we were ever allowed to use tools or, or put them out. So the answer to that is I don't work for the agency anymore, so I'm not sure, but I would say no. Thanks. <laughs> So have you heard? So have you seen difference between different uh, security systems, security agencies between levels of security? As example, like have you seen little difference between like someone like CIA versus F FBI versus? Okay, so uh, um, how is that? It, it's uh, so the, to, to be honest, the FBI is like they don't like to play well with others. Like they do their own thing, so they have their own requirements. Now DISA and and the NSA do work together on on, on items called STIGs, and so you can go, you can just Google DISA STIG. And it has configuration requirements, configuration settings for almost any device, any system, any operating system. These guys have a huge, well, I know, yeah, I know. <laughs> to some extent, they use generics, but, um, but they, uh, like, they've done, they've done a lot of testing with them. They work very, really well. The, the problem with it is that um, they just, they're afraid to use DISA STIGs because it, they're really harsh requirements. When you say they, like, what agencies are? The DSS. Okay. It's the, and their, their actual, their official answer is that we are, we're using the National Industrial Security Program Operating Manual. We are not the Department of Defense. So, and when I'm talking about like the, the corporations. So okay. they're a national I entity, not a federal entity. Okay. So I think it's a crap answer, but. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hey, thanks for uh, coming out here and giving this talk. I totally appreciate it. Cool. Um, so your recruiting speech has been amazing. Knowing that their bar for employment is so low and their pay is so high, I had yes. a couple of questions related to that. Taking a look at the job listings, um, first off, are they hiring in the Bay Area? Second off, how much are they paying? And third off, how much actual experience do they have? Because I have a friend who's not technical at all that ran out of a job that could use one. So uh, it's kind of a self-centered question. So. That's pretty much what I'm asking. Well, so I, uh, I applied. Uh, so I applied to a company. Uh, I applied to the, to the DSS in uh, February. I never heard anything back. So I applied to another defense contractor and got hired on. And almost nine months later, I finally got back and they said, "Oh yeah, do you want a job with the DSS?" And I said, "Okay, whatever." So actually, for a GS13, uh, the starting pay is uh, 81, or actually it's probably 82,000 now. Which I, I mean, I'm saying high. So I mean, this is for government position, pretty good benefits. Um, in the Bay Area, it's probably going to pay around 95, um, and uh, you, you just got you got about like six to nine month lead time. But I'm sure they are hiring. Actually, when I checked the job postings yesterday before I updated my slides, they didn't have any positions opening. But uh, the uh, the 2210s are considered as critical fill, so they're uh, they're going to be hiring all over the agency, I guess. Excellent. Thank cool. you very much. Yeah, go for it. Uh, yes, well, um, uh, well, I told them I wasn't going to move unless they paid for it. So they paid for me, but most of them are no PCS. So I was going to say, uh, uh, feel your pain. I know what it's like uh, starting the support group for people like us, meets in the bar Sweet. after all the talks. I'm, I'm, I'm in. Um, but I just want to comment, you know, the diet cap process is written by and for bureaucrats. A lot of times, you know, it's just paper drill and they say, oh, well, we'll accept all these risks because we just want to make it work. I know. And you know, see it time and time again. And CNA packages really are nothing more than telling adversaries how to get into your system. Oh, I know. Yeah. But, you know, and, and so DSS, uh, their answer to taking the CNA packages off, they took them off the internet because they said, well, we don't want our adversaries to know about them. <laughs> then why the hell can I request them through a FOIA request? If you're telling me that an adversary who really wants to get into an agency is er, into a company is not going to do a FOIA request, well, that's just ignorant. <laughs> you got one? Yeah, actually, um, I just wanted to say, I, I can't believe you just dropped the bomb. That's, that is, all, I feel the pain. Um, oh my gosh, that's amazing talk. Thanks. Um, uh, I just want to say, I, I couldn't help but uh, get the feeling here. Are, are you trying to ask DEF CON for, to, to do something for you? Are you? Hell yes. Is there a hidden message or something? No, no, no. I, I, you know, I, <laughs> I was told there might be some guys from the agency here. So, I, I mean, if they are, if they are in, the, in the audience, it's not, like I said, it's not a bash on you. But, like, you know, you got to do something about it. I mean, it's shit. So I think, thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>